Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Jordan Merlin Show for your Wednesday edition, Wednesday, January 10th, which was the final day for the SEC to approve the ARC ETF. And lo and behold, if it's not a spoof, which has been going around the rumors right now, is the SEC has approved all 11 of these spot Bitcoin ETFs. I'll have more on that here in a little bit. Could be an interesting development for the crypto world. Some saying it happened, others saying that it didn't. So uh, not quite sure what's going on there. Anyway, we are going to continue on with our discussions about market outlooks and bring on more traders, more perspectives, so you guys can see uh, away from my jaded opinions about what the market's going to do, get some other traders who are living this world and what they think the markets may do this year. So our guest today has been on the program many times in the past. I've got a, a wonderful picture from here looking all dapper on the streets of New York with thousands of people in the crowd. I love AI, by the way. Just some great pictures. Uh, we're going to do a 2024 market outlook with none other than Mr. Jeff Manson. Jeff, how you doing, my friend? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Merlin. Yeah, good. Oh, pleasure to have you back. It's been quite some time. What's new in your world? Oh, just uh, putting together um, business, putting together content, trading a lot, and, uh, you know, just uh, looking to build successful traders by helping them learn the, the pictures on the price chart. Nice. I, yeah. You, you've always been a, the fan, the advocate of the picture, right? Read that picture. Identify that picture. What are you looking at? Um, which I think is a good one. You know, one of the things that you and I have discussed in the past is that how so many people fail at trading because they don't have a plan and they're kind of just shooting from the hip and doing things differently every time. And that's one thing that's great about your approach is it's structured. I'm looking at the same thing every time. If I don't see the picture, I move on. Done. End of story. That's correct. Yeah. And there's so many things over on the left-hand side of the chart that people forget about. And, you know, that left-hand side of the chart is very important to to see where those orders are, are at. So, yeah. The picture is always the same, though. <laughs> it is. You know, it's it's funny you say the left hand side. You know, it's so many people want to know what the right hand side does, but the right side is all speculation and hope and, and anticipation. The left side is fact, right? The left side is what has happened in the past, and whether that's a retail trader or institutional trader, that's for you to discern. But those patterns that form. Ooh, was that me? What's up? Oh, a phone went off, and it was just really, really loud. Well, anyway, cool. <laughs> Uh, maybe it was mine. I didn't think it was. Anyway, um, yeah, my, I turned mine off. So anyway, mine is off too. All right, well, that was um, <laughs> awkward. <laughs> We've got some alerts going on here. Anyway, um, let, let's dive into our conversation today, which is going to be about market forecast. And I'm starting everybody off kind of with that same basic three questions, and we can go into whatever direction you decide to go into. First question on this one is: What is your biggest concern for 2024? As we start off, or you know, we're, we're ten days into January. What's your big concern if you have any? Well, a couple of the big concerns that I have is, you know, this, uh, the immigration type stuff that's, uh, we've had millions of people crossing the border and we, you know, we're right here down in Arizona. So we see a lot of that, that, uh, the border crossing right here. Um, uh, not knowing what's going to happen with that. Cause it sounds like they're just, uh, bringing people in and it depends whether they'll be able to vote or not, you know? So, and that, immigration policy and um, rolling into um, election year. I think that a lot of people are ready for a, a different change, not a far left change. But, um, you know, some of that, those things are really concerning me, how things are being really staged up. And, uh, you know, so those are my concerns. I'm having a struggle trusting the media and trying to find information because we've always gone to the media and found those things and um, just finding those right sources to um, rely on, you know, so. It's interesting you say that because I talked about this on the show yesterday or maybe yesterday or the day before where, you know, someone had said it's about finding, you know, the right news sources. And the tricky part is with AI and with, you know, Photoshop and deep fakes and all this different software, it's so easy to believe that something is real. Even if you're coming from a credible source, we've had major news agencies report that something was, you know, here's some news, come to find out it was fake news. So yeah, you're right. I, that That's an issue I think that every year is gonna get harder and harder and harder. Uh, who knows, maybe we need to have another government agency that is responsible for fact checking the data, but I wouldn't trust that one either. So yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> change we're witnessing over the last decade. That's that's so true. And, and you know, sometimes if you've got a good eye and you kind of know what AI does, you can catch it and then you say, OK, it's fake news. But not every time. Right. You know? And 
you know, it's like the old thing. If you tell a lie so many times, you know, people start believing it. Right. So it's like to get bombarded with all these things. And yeah, it's, there's a lot of um, my concern going forward in 2024 is how are they going to settle that down? Or is it just going to get catastrophically worse? You know? Yeah. So and, and, you know, it, you, you, I'm just kind of making notes here. You know, you couple that with your comments about the election. And of course, you know, it, it should be everyone's concern, whether it's a good concern or a bad concern is, is not relevant. It's just it's going to be a concern this year either way because of the election. Right. We, we don't know which way it's going to go and it's going to go one way or the other. So we, we know we're going to have some conclusion uh, come December. Uh, you know, barring any major debates uh, and, and mistakes in the voting. Um, I'm curious when you mentioned Im immigration. So obviously this isn't a political show, but when you look at the immigration issue, how does that impact you from a trading perspective? Or is that just a personal issue or is that a trading one? Uh, let's see. Well, it, it kind of boils over into the way the media has, it, back to the media, you know, and how it's, things are not being reported. And I, I think it's more of a, a personal concern. Um, it can spill over, I mean, into trading um, as, well, I guess let's, I'll just leave it. It's more of a personal concern because uh, uh, just seeing the amount of people coming, still coming, mm -hmm. okay, and the ones that are here and, and just the way things are being handled. I mean, we're seeing the border patrol people just lifting the fence and say, come on in. And it's wow. like, wait a minute, you were, your job was, I thought, to to protect their borders. So right. well, I guess, yeah, I guess in one way, time. you know, I guess it's a personal issue because you're, you're living right there. It's like just waving them as they come in your backyard. I guess the other part here is, you know, if it's such a major issue, and obviously I don't experience it as much where I'm at, um, but at some point, there may need to be action taken, and that may bring in new revenue streams for different businesses. And, and I guess we could maybe target some segments which might benefit if those entities were tasked with, you know, tougher border control or building, you know, walls or whatever the case may be. I, I guess that's one way you could see the impact of immigration impacting the markets is through different companies that would be in those industries. True, and you might, we might see some of the transportations go down when they do, actually do close down the borders. So because they're they're not buying plane tickets and uh, train tickets and bus tickets and, and new clothes and all that stuff. So there might be a kind of a, a pullback, if you will, um, once uh, somebody does close the borders and start uh, screening them again. Right. All right. Um, so I'll go to our our second question of the day so we got um, your in concerns for you are going to be immigration you've also got uh, the election coming up the second part of this let me get my graphic up here for the viewers is what do you think will be the best and worst performing market segments and this doesn't have to be a specific you know utilities versus energy it, it could be um, i know you look at a lot of different markets and you're um a fan of statistics i know you have all kinds of cycle information which i love when you talk about that stuff but um, from your perspective, what do you think are potentially, at least in your opinion, this is not financial advice, this is just an opinion, but the best, maybe the best performing and worst performing market segments of 2024? I've, I've been watching a lot of the AIs come on board and uh, reminding us of, you know, right before Y2K, 1998, and what we went through is the internet bubble. I'm wondering, you know, could, if AI is coming in, we got some big companies, just like we did with... Um, when the internet started coming in, we had some big companies, telecommunications, infrastructure, you know, is that going to become another boom, mm -hmm. you know? And um, of course, uh, we're already seeing some of that AI get way out of control when it comes to media and uh, things that we're doing there. By the way, thanks for the picture. You made me look pretty skinny, so <laughs> that helped. Love AI. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so... I'm watching that with a lot of curiosity. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, the Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies. And as you know, there's a lot of rumors and things like that, that they may be uh, uh, retiring the, the fiat cash mm -hmm. going to CBDC. You know, did I say that right? Yep. Central Bank Digital okay. Currencies. Correct. Okay. Uh, and that, along with the U.S. dollar. Now, U.S. dollar, from what I understand right now, is two years ago, three years ago, we were about 80% of the uh, 
the transactions worldwide, okay, with U.S. dollar using. And now we're down to about 30%. Ooh. Now, this is something we haven't experienced in our lifetime or when we were really young when the U.S. took over the, the sterling or some of us weren't around. I wasn't around. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the reserve currency is, you know, that shift usually – it um, starts with a lot of war and a lot of uncertainty. So we've seen that throughout history. And so we're in the middle of it. We've never seen uh, um, where we've transitioned from, you know, where the U.S. dollar has always been the king around the world. Now it's not so hot, you know. So something big has to change. And and from what I understand, uh, I'm not. I haven't verified these statistics, but it sounds like 75 percent of the world currencies are now going with the BRICS. Mm. And um, so, looking at BRICS Bank and looking at some of the uh, uh, ETFs or some of the uh, the cryptocurrency that might be tied to the BRICS uh, is some of those outlooks because those could expand very rapidly, especially with you know us trying to run and find investments to either hedge or protect ourselves and even looking going forward, you know, how are we going to sustain ourselves? So I, I, I have an answer to you on that one, how we're going to sustain ourselves. All right. We have okay. the largest military in the world. We'll force ourselves to be sustained, you know, and that's the, that's an interesting one. And I don't know about all the statistics and percentages that you mentioned. And I have to verify all those ones, but you know, we are seeing the decline in the U S dollar dominance. Now, you know, one of the discussions, which I don't think will be, I don't think it's that piece that's going to drive the markets wholly in 2024, but we're talking the next decade where it's, it's a debate of does the U.S. dollar lose its reserve currency status? We've talked about that before, which is, you know, do we have a um, there's a, a Muslim dollar potentially mm -hmm. or Muslim backed by gold? Not to have to be a dollar, but currency. You have the BRICS. So you have other consortiums getting together. And, you know, what does that look like down the road? I don't know. One thing I I'm feel fairly confident in is that the U.S. dollar will continue to lose its might as the world reserve currency. And I guess I would ask you this. If you knew that going in, that the expectation is over the next two, three, five, ten years that the dollar is going to continue to decline in usage, then ultimately it comes down to how do I trade that? What 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 positions can I put myself in to capitalize on that specific move in the dollar? So what, what plays would you make? Well, on a short-term basis, um, we uh, in the in our live trading room, um, we monitor the U.S. dollar, uh, and we monitor the ten-year yield together. And um, so, for this is just short-term intraday trading. Is when we start seeing a surge of the dollar moving up, we often see the equity indexes pulling back with a small lag, and the lag is anywhere from about five to eight minutes or so. Um, so we're leaning more on the dollar and the yield, and it seems like there's some algorithms or some AI that's also doing these small moves using the dollar and the yield. Mm -hmm. now, the last two days, we've had the periods of time where we've had momentum, the dollar and the yield were going together, 10-year yield, okay? And then when we get into this chop and very difficult, uh, stops are pretty wide, it, it uh, it's when the dollar and the yield go inverse or they're not correlated. So short term, um, using those two as some additional odds enhancers as to when to engage in the market and when to stay through that duration. Now, we've also seen around economic reports and when inflation data comes out, we got some big ones coming out yep, tomorrow, uh, Thursday and Friday. Um, and not sure how that's going to take the markets. Now, initially, because of where we are on the equity indexes, okay, we're right near all-time highs, okay? And we're above the 88.6% retracement off the, the all-time highs. So chances are we're going to keep going to the upside. And I struggle with uh, when markets are making all-time highs, okay, because you just don't know when to get out. <laughs> yeah, and you want to stay with it until you don't, you know, until it pulls back. But then every day it could look like it's pulling back. So yeah. I've been using some Fibonacci forecasting because um, that worked really well using uh, Fibonacci price extensions uh, to the upside. And I've measured on the weekly chart um, looking at SPX uh, up around 
next stop right around that 5200 level 5145 to 5200 is kind of where I'm, I'm looking for that projected move if we continue to make new highs you said, i'm just putting that 5145 you said yep all right, so right about where my the red horizontal line is on your screen is that level he's talking about, which, you know, from current price, uh, we can map out to where we are right now. You're looking at from current price, that would be roughly, I say roughly, uh, about 7.25% gain from current level. So certainly nothing unreasonable, especially when you look at historical market gains. Um, uh, and, and with that said, that's kind of the, the forecast there, what um, is that – by the end of the year, or are you just kind of loosely saying at some point in the near future we'll see fifty one thirty eight? Um, I think this is just a short term last um, move up. Uh, we should see um, this may take us up into right about the next couple of months, March, April, May ish. You know where we often see a pullback. Um, so I would say about within the first five to six months of the. Uh, this year, we should see that number. After that, I'd have to reassess if we get a pullback on that. We'll uh, we'll get you an assessment of the SPX at the end of the show here. Uh, I, I put everybody on this list, and uh, the winner gets two Trader Merlin shot glasses. So, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I know it's a huge prize. Hey, hey. <laughs> um, all right. So it, it looks like you're you're optimistic towards AI and and. I'll say digital assets because I think that there's a lot more to it than just cryptocurrency per se. Um, anything there that you look at and you go, ah, just it doesn't feel like it's going to be a good year for this segment or this market sector. I think it's going to get beaten down. Anything you're kind of bearish on? A lot of the FX products. Um, if the U.S. Uh, dollar does go even further down, or even you know the discontinue it, you know we've heard rumors about you know that uh, they may stop using U.S. paper notes or the fiat money and go to all digital. Right. Okay. Uh, I think Europe uh, just, it it went digital, but it also allowed people to use the other, they, they can use anything. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that's the route that the U.S. may take. Um, so when that starts to happen, I would be very cautious on the FX markets because as you know, sometimes the liquidity dries up during those um, times when the market are closed and you can get some horrendous spikes. And yeah. um, so you got to be monitoring multiple things. I mean, even your stop loss may get a lot of slippage on a move like that. And we've seen a lot of that happen with the Japanese yen and recently with some of the other uh, products that are out there getting huge moves up and then a straight move right back down, um, almost like a sweeping the stops. Yeah. Um, so I would be really cautious how the rest of the planet is going to do with the 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 BRICS bank and um, especially the FX markets. And I just recently saw some articles about Saudi uh, redoing their currency and being backed by by gold. Yeah. And uh, so that may change the outlook. I mean, we we Argentina needs to do something as well. Uh, with Argentina, you know, you got to take in a big stack of notes just to buy a cup of coffee. So I'm not sure if that's what we're heading into. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, you know, um, and as you and I have traveled around the world in many places, uh, we've seen, you know, where it takes, uh, you know, to buy dinner, it takes two million rupiah. You know, <laughs> and, you know, for us, that doesn't seem like a lot of money, U.S. dollars. But if the U.S. dollar does does devaluate like this, our indexes will have to follow. I mean, our, our stocks are based off the dollar. Yeah. But this is also so, something that's not going to, you know, this isn't something that like on third, we're not in the hyperinflation like Argentina is. You know, we we, we were up in the 10 percent. Now we're, you know, tickling the, the three and a half, four percent. But, uh, you know, that type of price action i would argue is going to take a long time right that's not a that's not a short term swing that's that's position you know going into years for that type of to really set up with that big of a move right so we just come right back to the charts i mean we yeah. have to follow what the banks and institutions are doing uh, along that line just what we've been noticing in our live trading room a lot is between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. Eastern is when we see that supply and demand technique work the best. Outside of that, it seems like after 11 a.m. Eastern into the lunchtime doldrums, 
it it's all about what are technical okay technical indicators uptrend downtrend cup and handle you know patterns and things like that so we are having to you know when we're trading supply and demand if you're a supply and demand trader okay your best opportunities are going to be between that 8 a.m and 11 a.m when price returns to a zone outside of that it tends to be taking on additional risk um, and this is more of the intraday trading that we're talking about um, of course the big term longer term you're just kind of ignoring all the intraday swings right but if you are a short-term trader and we have a lot of them online with us tonight is that you have to know when to shift a strategy okay now everything is around that supply and demand but you have to um, understand how the novice and even the algorithm, AI algorithms that are coming in. And I notice a lot of the AI algorithms are using support and resistance mm -hmm. a lot. Yep. A lot. Not demand or supply. It's like they haven't been shown demand or supply zones. It's They've just been, one line, one point. Yep. And that's where we've been getting a lot of our feel is okay, let's switch over to. Um, what the novice traders know because they're more active after 11 a.m where the banks and institutions are more in control between 8 a.m and 11. so some things that we're noticing and documenting on a day-to-day -day basis um a couple questions came through one of them was um what are you trading the most futures options equities where, where would you say a bulk of your time is spent uh most of my time is spent on the, the futures market um mainly because of the way it moves intraday and because of the odds enhancers that are in front of it. The futures always follow something. So we're using uh, some one of the new products that we're watching, which uh, just was acquired a couple of years ago by the NASDAQ exchange, is the BKX, the bank index. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's 24 of the largest regional and national banks that we have in the U.S., so the rule behind that is don't fight the banks. So when you're doing your charting and you want to see some of the trends, you know, we're using futures because they're a derivative and they always follow something. Okay. So using the bank indexes, okay, so we're using uh, many other things that we watch to help us understand the trading environment before we, we jump into it as well. So, I mainly focus on futures because I'm I can teach better with futures because of the liquidity and the movement with stocks. Often uh, the larger time frames are a little more favorable. So I want students to see that what we're teaching and what we're bringing in is working, and they get to see it live. We have just recently added uh, some forex trades uh, that we're we're posting in our Discord room for everybody to participate in. Um, so I'm moving a little bit more towards the Forex because of the comments earlier uh, and posting more trades on that. I do a lot of my um, research on stocks as far as training the eyes, mm -hmm. understand where the, uh, you know, what trade do I desire on that price chart? And I find a peak or a valley, and then I look left and I start gathering the information on the left-hand side of the chart that supports or has evidence that, price will turn on the right hand side so a lot of fun with that and pretty um are you Sorry. no it's okay so i'm just getting people that senses to know your style um so predominantly futures moving a little bit more towards the spot just because it might be very attractive this year because of all the volatility and predom i would say predominantly swing trading your day your trades are a couple days maybe a week or so typically or are you shorter term Say that last part again. Are, are you are you one that your trades are typically uh, maybe a couple of days, a couple of weeks, or is it predominantly intraday? Uh, anywhere from that, mostly intraday, because we're always in that teaching mode, and I'm with my students pretty much all week long. Um, more of an intraday trader, but there are trades that I will stay in overnight and stay for about three to five days uh, in these market conditions. Um, yeah, as we're getting to highs, you know, it's just one big drop is going to wipe out a lot of things. So I'm cautiously kind of 
going shorter term as the market keeps creeping up mm -hmm. and um, just getting defensive at this point. Nice. All right. Um, so let me ask this last one that we can go into any any direction you want to go into. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about some of your targets for, you know, 51, I thought it was 51.45 on the SPX. Um, where do you think we're going to be at the end of the year? I know it, it's it so doesn't really matter because it's so far away. But, you know, you're like me. You're, you like to go out there and say, hey, you know what, I think that this could be about here based off this and this. So if you had to, what would you say the SPX is going to be at by the end of the year? And I'll put you on the list for these lustrous uh, Trader Merlin shot glasses. By the end of the year, uh, yeah. 55.43 to 5,600. 55.43. I'm putting 55.43, which would give you, let's see, just get the formula. That means you think about 16.23% gain for the year. There we go. Yes. You're, you're on the list. Um, okay, <laughs> Who do I win? <laughs> you get my two Trader Merlin shot glasses, man. All right. And some, and I think Margaret said that if I get if you win those, that they need to be full as well. So maybe, oh, no, that was Liz. Uh, Liz says I need to make sure that those full. Maybe, who knows? Maybe I'll even go to Arizona and deliver them and have a bottle with me. That would be the better way to do it, right? There you go. <laughs> um, you know, 16%. Let's just look at, take a step back and look at that. Historical market average rate of return, 8 to 10%. Uh, during an election year when it's a new president election is 7%. Uh, I had Jeff... Um, uh, I had Jeffrey Hirsch on the program yesterday of Stock Traders Almanac, and he was saying, tw I even wrote this one down, it was 12.8% rate of return when we had a sitting president election year. Um, you're higher than that. So what, what factors do you do you see there that are going to push this market higher? Is, is it the the impending rate cuts by the Fed? Uh, you know, what, what, what sort of things are you seeing that's going to cause this market to beat historical norms by a good margin? Yeah, it was purely technical. Um, when I was going through the charts, uh, this afternoon and looking for projected moves since um, I use a technique using Fibonacci price extensions mm -hmm. and using the swings in the market to project up those and getting a confluence of where those uh, Fibonacci lines all line up. And um, this is why we had uh, the confluence level at 51.45. We had confluence at 55.43 and then the far stretch up there around uh, 6,400. Now, that's again on a weekly chart, but we have seen that kind of move like in 2000, uh, well, basically off the lows uh, of 2022 and, and uh, that, that run we had from 2021. You know, some of those are in play in, in during election years as well, you know, and following along with what Stock Traders Almanac does as far as the uh, uh, direction. Um, is I was using those Fibonacci price extension lines to say, okay, if we do keep going up, what is the next viable place? And uh, it purely technical, mm -hmm. just drawing the, the the last three swings up or, or up and down, and then just projecting out to those levels. Um, Margaret asks here. She says, you know, what about measured moves using chart patterns? Um, and I'm I'm a I'm an addict of chart patterns, I will admit. And you know, sometimes these measured moves can be valuable in you anticipating where things are going to go. How does that play into your trades? Uh, measured moves are also a very vital part of that. Um, that symmetry in the market affects a lot of behavioral science. Okay, people like things organized. They like to see them do what they anticipate them to do. And when you're looking at a price chart, you see the left hand side of the chart but you're focused on the right-hand side of the chart, uh, that those peaks and valleys and those, that symmetry does play out a lot of times, okay? So when we see a move up and then a pullback, and in the context of an uptrend, we're saying, hey, if the AB leg equals the CD leg, it should come up to X point, okay? I, I like measured moves because they verify something. I combine those measured moves with a supply zone or a demand zone. I also use some other candle patterns that I use to that are within the range of that Fibonacci level. You know, as we were talking about earlier, everything kind of blends together, but it's really the same picture. Just you're looking at the, the price charts and you're seeing those symmetrical moves. Yep. You know, and, and I think for Margaret, you know, I'm not going to speak for Jeff here, but, 
when we get a measured move, we've had a couple of good ones last year, right? We were looking at that great measured move on the head and shoulders pattern from the from the uh, uh, Russell 2000. That was a great head and shoulders pattern. I think I forgot the other one. We had another inverted head and shoulders, which was perfect. And I like to use those as me kind of saying, what's the, the probability? What are the odds of me getting to that level, getting to that target? And, and I'll wrap my, my uh, trade plan around that. Um, I will say though, with a measured move, I'm not. It's not the foundation of the trade, right? It's not like it's that critical. It's not the piece that makes it for me, but it certainly helps. And you could look at something here like the SPX right now. Uh, you could make the argument that we are in a ascending triangle on SPX going all the way back into 2020. All right. Well, mm -hmm. what do we do there? Well, you draw your line across the top here. Your measured move would be down to from the 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 top of that triangle to the base there, which is going to be right here. It's in snap mode, so I apologize. It's going to uh, drive me nuts, but I will show you here what that looks like. That would mean that if I was using this measured move on the SPX, that my target for the SPX, if it broke out of this ascending triangle, would be roughly, oh boy, it's going to be a long one. Uh, that's going to put it at 6594, roughly 6594, called 6600. Now look. Hey, that's right right in the middle of my zone. <laughs> Perfect. I love when a plan comes together. And you know, while while I might be uh, you know, certainly I would love to buy the market right now at 4783 and hold it for 2000 points. There's not a person in the room that's going to that oh, I don't want 1800 points on the SPX. Come on, you'd all just drool over that thing. That'd be a trade of a lifetime to catch like that. But um Unfortunately, I don't use them for that big of targets. Now, some of the smaller ones would be more reasonable. If I'm a long-term investor, then maybe I am playing that target of 6,600 on the SPX. You know? And um, you got to have your, your trade management in place, I think, is the key point there if you're using the, uh, the those measured moves. Sorry, I digressed there. I went a little bit off the rails, but thank you, Margaret, for the question. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, you know along with the measured moves, you know usually I'll take the last three swing three swings up or three swings down, and I'll use a, maybe a, a fifty simple moving average at the mean. And when we're talking about measured moves, one of the things that um, is really important is averages. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you have to remember that eighty eight percent of the time you get eighty percent of the average. So you have that. You know, if you're looking at 100%, trim off about that and have that upper part of that uh, projected move, uh, have that range from 80 to 100% kind of marked in the, the red. That's where the possible price could change direction. And um, especially when we are getting up in these higher levels, okay, you want to make sure you're not always going for that 100%. It's going to look for 88% of the time, you get 80% of the average. And you could stay pretty safe in that. 88% of the time, you get 88% of the average. All right. That's an interesting one. I like the way you look at that. <laughs> um, anything else in the in the financial markets that you think is of interest today? Anything uh, tickling your fancy out there? Any, any specific stocks you like? I think you're more of a bigger ETF kind of guy, but anything there that's uh, exciting and noteworthy than you're in your world? I know you're a statistics and numbers guy, which is uh, I always love your numbers. <laughs> um, are we only doing the measurement on the SPX, or did you want the Dow too? Ah, you can do whatever you like. Whatever you like. I might get get two prizes out of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a, no. There's not doing a no prize for that one. I got to stick to one. I got it's enough. It's like herding cats. There's so many people sending me numbers, but uh, no. But I would like to hear your forecast on it. Uh, first level. I mean, we're approaching a level where we might have a little pause here. Um, but if we break through that 39,257, and uh, after that, 41,900. All right, 41,900 on the Dow, huh? Let me ask you this, Jeff. How relevant is the Dow to you? What's that? How relevant is the Dow to you? You know, it seems like, it, and from my perspective, I don't really even look at the Dow because it's 30 companies and, and who cares? Now, when I lived international, I watched it all the time because I'm living in Italy and it, every time a newscast came on, it was the Dow was doing this. Um, you know, if I look at it, and, and this is just my take, you're curious what you want, what you think. From my perspective, I'm looking at, of, in order of importance, right, and, and giving me clues of market, whether that's broad market, tech, small caps, et cetera, number one is the S&P. It's a dog that wags the tail. Number two mm -hmm. is going to be the NASDAQ because technology is the dominant force right now. i got to pay attention there. Number three is the Russell 2000 because it represents all the small caps. The Dow, I, I just, I don't know. I don't even really, 
I, I haven't traded the Dow in years, and I almost could care less about it. So why, why the Dow? Is it just something to trade, or does it really mean something to you? Well, you got to look, the Dow and the, all, all the Dow 30 stocks trade on the S&P 500. Right. So in a way, you're indirectly interpreting the direction if you're, if you're watching the S&P. Uh, S&P is the bellwether, the big 900-pound gorilla, so to speak. But the top companies on the S&P 500 are the Dow stocks. Now, when you're monitoring the Dow stocks, uh, you can see quite often if you're going through them on a day-to-day -day basis, you'll see that uh, 10 were up, 10 were down, mm -hmm. and 10 sideways. Okay, so it's following the S&P may be an odds enhancer to trade the Dow or at least get that direction. The Dow Jones is also a price weighted index. It's not a market capitalization right. weighted index. So it it gives us a, a little more information. Now, if I'm going to take a trade on the Dow, I'm always referencing the S and P. Okay, interesting. <laughs> See where those bigger companies are moving. Mm -hmm. The other part is if you're supply and demand traders are out there, you want to stick with stocks that have that big volume where the banks and institutions are most actively engaging on a day-to-day -day basis with the um with the companies and you know taking deposits in sending them money for they want to build some new stuff okay so they're they're kind of all the Dow 30 stocks are pretty much on my watch list um and trading the s p now the nasdaq only has about five or six uh, that are on the dow and the s p and, um, you know, the Russell 2000 is kind of all, all on its own. Uh, none of the doubt, none of the uh, Russell 2000 stocks trade on the S&P 500 or the um, the Dow. OK, right. That's why the Russell's always kind of been the odd one out. But as of recently, you know, in the winter, fall and winter, often we see the, the bigger companies, uh, the large market cap weighted stocks they tend to be stronger and then during the spring and summer we often see that the russell comes back okay it's just an expansion and contraction of them all but those are some of the seasonality type things that i i do see with the the indexes yeah not quite cool. just just it was of interest and i didn't mean to you know to shoot down the dow and and, and pepe makes a good point he goes i know full-time traders that their main instrument to trade is the dow yeah and honestly if you're starting out with futures the dow is probably a good place to start because its price per tick is lower than any of the other futures contracts so it, it could be a little bit safer there. Of course, you could just now go down to the micros and, and call it a day there if you're trying to minimize your risk. Um, what else did I have a question? Uh, question for Jeff. Uh, no, Pepe. Um, Margaret answered that question there. She's not part of his team anymore. Um, let's see. When I have an options trade on, I look at Microsoft for the Dow. Well, remember, Microsoft is probably more heavily weighted in the NASDAQ. Uh, if you're looking for the leading indicator, you might want to look at the NASDAQ. I don't know the percentage of debt that Microsoft is of the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but again, it's price weighted, so that's going to change depending on what the price is. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think I got pretty much everything covered there. We got your forecast for the year. You're definitely bullish on the year. I'm wondering what it's going to take, Jeff. At some point, I'm going to have you on the show, and you're going to be like, man, I am bearish as all heck. Because I've had you on for years, and you've been bullish and bullish and bullish. I have pictures of you with rocket ships going into space because you're talking about <laughs> liftoff of the markets. And hey, uh, bravo! It's been it's been working in your favor. At some point, um, the markets are going to tell you enough is enough, and and I'm waiting to see that moment where you go, I'm bearish. It's going to be a glorious day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't seen it on the large time frames, um, and and that's been pretty pretty obvious. You know, over the last uh, since. Uh, what November, even October, yep. we've seen that that was a low point and the market has been climbing. Now, I would love to see a pullback into where we can get into it. Now, the, 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 the time that we're at right now, markets are still climbing. I'm looking at weekly charts. I'm looking at daily charts and they keep moving up. Um, what I would like to see is a pullback in order for us to jump back in or at mm -hmm. least find a, a better place to get in. Um, and that's why we kind of start getting smaller and smaller time frames when we start getting up into these higher areas. 
because we're still looking to buy the dips in the context of an uptrend. But sometimes we like to play the the pullbacks. Yeah. Okay. You, you know, and looking at the SP, uh, I'm looking at the SP futures now. But you know, going back to uh, Thursday, uh, last Thursday, you know, we broke we broke just a short term pivot low, right? We had these lows from December 20th and 21st. We broke those. I'm like, okay, well, now we might get that deeper pullback. Which for me, I was looking at the S and P getting at about 45.75, and you know, we we went down for another day. And all of a sudden, we just ripped back up, and it's been going up ever since. And when you look for a pullback, is there is there an area that you're looking at? Because I've got the forty five seventy five to forty five forty three marked out, but is it where are you looking at for a pullback here? Wow, we have a we have that area on the S S and P futures mm -hmm. right around that forty five hundred area, but that's not quite a zone. See, when, when they look at the, the picture of like a buy territory, you know, price happened to go up and hit resistance. And then underneath is where we have the accumulation of orders to get that move up. Right. You have that breakout point and then you look for the pullback. Well, when that low pivot point makes a lower low before the breakout, okay, we often look for price to come back deeper in that, that buy territory. And that's putting a, a, on the S&P daily chart, um, that's putting that buy um, that demand zone that I'm looking for that's qualified on a daily chart about 4,200. Mm. Okay. See it. See a lot lower here. All right. I mean, mm -hmm. that would be you know at that point, and this is a good you know this is enough this is getting into technical stuff. But if we get down to that 4,200 mark, it does is that trend still intact to you? Because it seems to me that if we broke below that 4,560 mark. It might at that point I'm going okay. I think that that trend is broken, and now we're looking more downside. But you know that's a that's a pretty significant pullback. If you go from current levels down to 4,200, I mean you're looking to slide about 12.8 percent. You know that that's that's a lot of money left on the table there. We have to be ready for where the banks and institutions have unfilled orders. Right. I, now at the time of the pullback, you know the sky is falling. Nobody's going to want to get into it, and that's usually the best time to engage <laughs> okay and of course if it did it abruptly um and dropped uh, the 12 percent um we would have a, a good opportunity now this is why when you're doing your homework is just let the chart speak to you find the demand zone that's in the right area okay and i do want to specify on that a little bit is that when you qu have a qualified support and resistance area, okay, and let's just say we have a resistance and price keeps coming up and hitting it, all they're doing is filling the sell tickets until they run out. But underneath that is where all the buyers keep pushing price back up. The breakout point is where we see the, the battle has been done, okay, and price starts running up, but that area back in the buy territory is the demand zone. Right. Okay. So, any chart that you go back and look at historically is going to have that basically that same footprint when you look further over to the left hand side so all things being equal if i'm looking at daily charts that footprint is you know speaks to me right there about that 4209 area okay on a smaller time frame we'll find a lot in there yeah yeah definitely all right, uh, just throwing some some curveballs at you. I'm trying to stump you. No, you know I wouldn't try to do that. <laughs> That's a good thing when we get real traders on. You know, it's hard to stump somebody with a price chart. Um, so I'm going to drive people over here. Let me show your your website over here. This is let's bring it up there. Um, this is the market inst the marketinstitution.com. Uh, that's mm -hmm. Jeff's new trading company. If you guys want more information, he's got all kinds of courses there. Uh, really, it's all about just registering. So once you get to register, he's got all kinds of things he'll send you. And anything else you want to talk about your your uh, market institution? Well, we do have some classes coming up. Um, and if people want to come in and kick the tires, we do have a, a Discord room that um, all they have to do is register. And then they'll get an email with uh, what's in there. Um, in our Discord room, I do post my... Um, my picks that I post every day. Uh, we uh, have a lot of different chat rooms going on and a lot of different uh, uh, students that trade active income that we trade all day long. I usually will be there and hanging out with the students after I've done my, my classes and such. 
and it's been become a really great community. Some wonderful people and new ones are coming on all the time. And uh, everybody is just a really great person in there. We're all after the same thing. And, you know, my motto, and I know yours has been for, is traders helping traders. Yeah. You know, it's, we're all here to help each other. And that's probably the main reason you're doing the show a lot is that you help a lot of people. And in doing that, we've developed a really nice community of people. And we have places where we like to document picture perfect past trades, okay? And make sure the past is in there. So we're not <laughs> forecasting out there where we do some of that. But the way we train the eyes is we look at a price chart and we find a pivot low or a pivot high, a, a place we desire to catch a trade. And then we start looking to the left and say, what evidence was over on the left-hand side of the chart that's consistently there when we have a desired trade? And that's how we start off with. Uh, one of my students uh, has just been submitting um, all of his, you know, I tell everybody, give me 100 picture-perfect past trades. And, and so many people will start it, but they keep going right back over to the right side. Yeah. And my philosophy is that if you don't know what a picture perfect pass trade looks like, something that you can build a trade plan off of, you need to spend some more time on the left hand side of the chart before you chart start trying to forecast the right. So a lot of great stuff in there. Um, so when you sign up for the Discord, you get to hang out with all of us. Uh, we do have live trading in there. We have uh, announcements. We have uh, picture perfect pass trades, setups. We share uh, workspaces. So if you're just starting out, I mean, it's it's a lot. Yep. Okay. And uh, we're, uh, Amit, uh, one of my uh, uh, coworkers there, he is uh, starting to put together more stock trades. And we do have uh, several students that post stock trades in our, our Discord room. And they are doing amazing. And what's fantastic about this is they're all drawing the same charts. That's a tough one. That's, okay. that's and, you, you know how that, difficult that is to get everyone to draw the same picture. Correct. Yeah. So nice. that's why, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching the crypto markets quite a bit because we don't have a lot of that institutional participation yet. You, you will after today. Yep. Uh, so it is official. We have 11 of the spot Bitcoin ETS have been approved. Uh, Fidelity already has four of them listed as starting to trade tomorrow morning. So institution involvement is now going to be a major piece of crypto, or at least for wow. Bitcoin, excuse me, for Bitcoin. And we just seen uh, Bitcoin uh, is now back up. It hasn't taken out the high yet, but it uh, it's back up six, uh, 620 points. Uh, yeah, 620 bucks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it uh, had a sharp sell-off initially, and then just it's rebounded pretty nicely there. The uh, the other thing I would point out is, you know, you have the micro Bitcoin futures. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, they're with the Ethereum Bitcoin micro, it, it's like 70 bucks a contract. Now, don't, don't let the margin amount... Uh, uh, get to you and think, oh, well, heck, I'll just throw a lot of money at it. Right. No, it, it still moves a lot, okay? And you are trading a leveraged instrument. But the the margin rates for Bitcoin futures on the micro side are very easy to, and, and they're very inexpensive. Yeah. Uh, well, well, we'll probably see much more competition in that space. And pretty soon, what I'm looking forward to, and I think this could change things significantly, is once these spot ETFs get enough liquidity and we get a filtration out from 11 down to probably three, my guess would be, uh, then all of a sudden you'll see options start to build on those and that'll be make it even more oh, fun. Wow. So, All right. Well, Jeff, I got I to gotta run here, but I uh, appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much. Been been quite some time since we had you on. We'll get you on a bit more frequently because I love having fun with you in your graphics. Uh, I enjoy making my thumbnails of you. I didn't have you in a rocket ship this time, but more time I'll, I'll have you another great picture. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for having me, Merlin. It's great to talk to you as always, and uh, have a good rest of the day. You too, and uh, may all your trades be green till next time we talk, my friend. All right. All right, take Thank care. Thank you, Merlin. Bye-bye. Guys, that was Jeff Manson. And I have the, the, the page up here of his, which was, as you can see here, themarketinstitution.com. Find out more information there, register, log in, whatever you want. You got all the information you need there. Um, 
uh, Mr. Mason or Manson's Discord server name. Uh, that I don't know. You can get all the information, uh, Ken, by going to this market, themarketinstitution.com. He's got all the information there. All right, let me wrap this up here real quick. Uh, obviously, I was talking about the Bitcoin spot ETF, which has been approved. I want to go through and read the official document, but as soon as they posted that on their SEC website, the website crashed. Shocking. Um, you guys may have heard that the the hack yesterday of the or day before yesterday. Um, they posted on the SEC's Twitter account that the spot Bitcoin ETF was approved, and that was not. And the SEC claimed that it was hacked. What's funny is it was hacked because they don't use two-factor authentication. Elon Musk made a statement to that effect that the SEC, who's responsible for security and making sure that things are safe, is not using two-factor authentication on their Twitter account. It makes you wonder... What are the areas are they just grossly incompetent at? So anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, let's go to your economic calendar for tomorrow just so I can get that one out of the way. It's a big day. Starting one hour before the market's open, you guys, consumer price index numbers coming out. They are expected to tick up just slightly. You can see here the year-over-year -year numbers are expected to go from 3.1 to 3.2. That would be good for anybody who's got I bonds that have had the yields drop quite a bit and see that CPI number tick back up just a little bit. Um, oh, all in all, it's still looking pretty good, though. Nice downtrend going on since that big spike we saw uh, going back into 2022, uh, drifting lower and lower and lower there. So, OK, I'll, I'll call that fine. But any um, outlier that's outside the norm of expectations could cause big swings in tomorrow's market. Remember, markets are anticipating uh, six rate cuts next year, or sorry, this year, six. And if this number continues to tick up, then that's going to go from six to five to four to three, depending on how severe inflation gets. And again, I think a lot of this will be backed up by energy. Um, that is pretty much it on the economic calendar. You do have natural gas storage. Um, I'll run through the markets here real quick, but natural gas got just brutalized today. Yesterday uh, was a great day for natural gas, and today gave it pretty much all back. Here's Bitcoin, and this is as of right now, uh, down 1.53% on the day. Um, technically, though, still looks great. That chart still looks fantastic. Uh, I was actually anticipating a bigger sell-off on the approval from that spot Bitcoin ETF, but we shall see. Crude oil, down 1.2%. Really nothing from a technical perspective. Still continuing that downtrend. It's making slightly higher lows, but the important part here is that those highs are getting lower and lower and lower that's the that's the important part there uh crude or uh, gold gold continuing to drift lower it was down 0.2 percent at 0.26 percent today you know the more that it just kind of keeps lingering here and drifting slowly i just think you're gonna end up closing this gap which is why i have this demand zone on gold down around 1987 dollar index today slightly down nothing that significant down 0.16 percent it still looks like a, a bullish flag pattern is kind of hesitating here and just kind of going sideways right now um uh tom says sec hack no sec use password one two three is their password sadly you're probably right tom it probably was something like that just unbelievable that the, the regulatory body can't even have any sort of you know strong security measures on their accounts oh oh the faith i have in my regulators um <clears throat> just 10 year Slightly up. Uh, it was slightly up today. Just just a little bit, so nothing really to talk of there. Podium time, Russell 2000. Again, it's really a spinning top formation. You have small tails on top and bottom with a small real body, so eh, no big deal there. S&P, that was your exciting one, right? We're up 0.57% on the S&P futures today. We're coming right back towards those all-time highs. People thought we'd um, set a new all-time high by the end of the year. Well, we are going to set one here probably by the end of the week uh, it looks like it we're, we're i'm gonna rally up here rally up i'm gonna draw a line right across these highs here with snap mode just so i can get the exact number that we saw in december 4841 was your high and we are closed at 4820 so could easily get through that by tomorrow nasdaq best performer 0.68 percent similar picture looks like a nice little pullback and then all of a sudden rallied out for the last three days i think you'll challenge those highs i think you have some optimism with the spot bitcoin etf not just for crypto but i think that could actually be positive for the markets overall merlin which is the bitcoin miner or best way to trade bitcoin best way to trade bitcoin michael is to buy bitcoin buy physical bitcoin buy bitcoin own bitcoin and keep your bitcoin off an exchange that's the best way to do it um, if you keep, if you buy these new ETFs that are coming out, and by the way, ticker symbols for them. Let me see if, if any of them even have any listing going up. First one's going to be uh, Fidelity Wise Origin. That's FBTC. I'm going to write these ones down. You're probably going to see, oh, 
it's weird that this this is this is weird. It shouldn't be FBTC showing trades. ARKB. Yeah, I'm not sure why these are. This is coming up wrong. But ARK B should be the ticker symbol. H O D L should be the other one. Uh, Easy B C should be one of them as well. I'm gonna go through. Hopefully tonight, I've got a ton going on uh, where I can map out these 11 ETFs ticker symbols and see which one will be trading when. Um, but number, if you want to go in order, Michael, of, of the best way to get involved with Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin, buy a little nano ledger like this, and keep your, um, your crypto in your custody. Don't keep it on an exchange or in a different wallet. Put it in cold storage and keep it yourself. That's number one. Number two... You go to the uh, exchange and buy Bitcoin and you keep it on the exchange. Number three, you go for the spot Bitcoin ETFs. Um, that would be the other way. Number four is probably buy MicroStrategy, buy MSTR. Number five would be to buy the miners. Uh, I personally am not going to mess with the Bitcoin futures at all. I don't, I've don't. i looked at the composition of those and I just don't even understand the, how that product is even built. Um, Ethan's having a great run. Uh, yeah, Big Ed, that's my second largest holding. So I was actually very happy to see how Ethereum is just ripping to the upside today. You know, you have a lot of stuff that's up double digits. Um, you have Hex and Bonk. For those that don't know, these are these are what are called shit coins. They are meme style coins. They don't do anything. These are these are absolute jokes. But I'll scroll down here to Polkadot, which is another one up 11%. That's great for me. Uh, I've been investing in Polkadot for a long time. Bitcoin, where's my BTC? Show me that Bitcoin. I want the real one, not the futures product. Here's your Bitcoin. Only up 1.75% on the day, 46,933 as we speak right now. And then Ethereum has really been on a run, 8.91% today. Just smoke to the upside. Love it. Keep on going. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't do BitF. That's Beto or that's a... The problem is the constitution. How... how oh, sorry, you're talking miners. I thought I talked Beto. Um, I don't know enough about miners, Michael. I'm going to go with the big dogs. So uh, I can't make any sort of picks there with regards to miners, but I would go with the big ones. Now, the, you can buy into some digital asset ETFs that are out there, which have a, a mix of different miners in there. I don't know if there's specifically a miner ETF, which there probably will be at some point in the near future. Uh, what's the best way to lose your Bitcoin? Easy. Lose your private key. Lose your seed phrase uh, and your crypto has gone, gone forever. All right, let me see. Two minutes left. Merlin, do you have any videos on how to transfer Bitcoin from Coinbase to a ledger? Uh, I don't, Chio, but I might start putting a couple of those up on my website just for fun. Not my website, but my YouTube channel. All right, I got to go. Uh, tomorrow, guys, we will have Corey Lane on the program. We'll talk more options, but since Corey runs a hedge fund, I thought it'd be interesting to see what his outlook is for 2024. I'm going to ask him these same three questions, and then that should be it. I think I have um, Justin Krebs going to be on next week. But for right now, Corey Lane's the last one for this week, and I'll do a whole uh, Friday Q&A show with you. So that's going to do it for me for today, everybody. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, Jeff Mance on the program. You can go check him out at themarketinstitution.com if you want to know anything about uh, what Jeff is up to, any courses or programming there. That said, have a fantastic remainder of your day. I will see you all tomorrow with Corey Lane of Trader's Army talking about his 2020 market outlook. Take care.